Welcome to the Watchmen Privacy Podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined by Kerry Parker. He is the author of a book on cybersecurity called Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. He also has a podcast of the same name, Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. And he is a guy who has been in the cybersecurity community as uh, part of his career. And he retired and he started talking about these things to the public. Kerry, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thanks, Gabriel. Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. And so you talk about security and privacy. And I thought I'd just kind of start with a, a big picture question uh, for you. I think that privacy techniques almost always improve one's security. However, there are times when we're using software online and we have to trust someone and you know that's where security comes in. And Apple in recent years has honed in on its approach to security. That is, we will provide your security from on high by restricting your things that you can do on your device, by heavily curating the types of things that you can download, by scanning and monitoring and such. So Apple has emphasized the wide gulf that can exist between security and privacy. And there's a point to be made there because if you mess up something on your device, you can get something compromised, which would harm your privacy in turn. How should people who are more concerned with privacy than security think about this kind of security privacy debate? Yeah, we could, we could probably take the whole hour on that one question. So let me let me just you know give you some maybe highlights of, of how I how I feel on this. First of all, you know there's a lot of people talk about you know security versus privacy, and 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 I, I like to quickly point out that the two aren't mutually exclusive. Like a lot of people say, well, you need to give up one to have the other. There's some famous quotes along those lines from history. Uh, and of course, I don't believe that. I doubt you do either. Uh, to me, security enables privacy. And, you know, in particular, we're talking about, you know, encryption, for example. That is the first, the, maybe the misconception that I think we really got to drive out of people's minds is that, is that you, you know, in order to have security, you know, when people talk about in this sense, they usually talk about like national security or, you know, protect me from the bad guys or, or, or whatever, you know, in order for law enforcement or intelligence agencies to do that, we need to give up you know, a certain degree of privacy so that they can monitor us. And I, I, I do not believe that's true. Uh, there are certainly some trade-offs to be made, but, uh, you know, I'd like to uh, just initially just make sure we, we get that out of the way. But for me, when I talk security versus privacy, it's really more of a comparison. You know, what, what, what is the difference? Because for a long time, you know, I kind of lumped them together. I mean, as I grew uh, over the years doing the podcast and the book and talking to more people and just kind of maturing more myself, you know, I, I realized that they're, those are not the same thing. And you can have security without having privacy. And I, Google, to me, is a great example of that. They, they're they actually quite good when it comes to security. They've got, you know, their Project Zero and some of their other uh, security initiatives are quite good. And, and, and a lot of their products, I think, are plenty secure. They're just not private. And <laughs> because Google is an ad company that, that happens to make a search engine, that happens to make a, a mobile operating system, that happens to make... Uh, you know, an online docs program that everybody uses and calendars and email and all these things that are quote unquote free, you know, so I think that's kind of a, a good example of why they're not the same thing. And, and, and so anyway, you mentioned Apple uh, and Apple is, you know, a lot of people like to diss on Apple and I, I'm an Apple fanboy. I'll just say that at the outset. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about Apple through here. I, I've been using Apple for many, many years and, and, and like it or not, I mean, Apple, isn't an ad company. Now they do have a very small ad business, so they do make some money there. I really honestly wish they wouldn't. I wish they would just set that aside. And it's a conflict of interest as far as I'm concerned. I wish they wouldn't do it. Um, but it's very, very small. It's nothing like Google uh, or Facebook or some of these other companies. And so they kind of have the luxury because they sell hardware and they give away their software. And so they kind of have the luxury of saying, well, we don't want your data because we don't need your data. And they, they really don't. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think Apple has a leg up because they can they can not bother they can they can say they're a privacy company but in the end of the day they don't really need your data so they don't collect it uh, for the most part from a security standpoint it's interesting you also bring this up is that apple is a walled garden and they are very you know, they're very strict they're the, when you're on an apple e ecosystem you use apple products and in a lot of cases they don't let you do otherwise and there are even lawsuits in various countries trying to change that like opening up their app to, app store um and that has pros and cons, but from a security perspective and even from a privacy perspective, it allows Apple to exert a lot more control. It gives you less choice. And that, I think that's where a lot of people chafe. Certainly a lot of people I know in my community and the engineering community, you know, I bought this. I want to do whatever I want with it. I want to install whatever software I want to put on this thing. Don't tell me what I can and can't do. Uh, but for the average populace, it, you know, that kind of restriction, that sort of limitation 
ends up kind of being a good thing for security because it means that most of the stuff is more highly vetted. It's controlled by Apple. It, because it's within the ecosystem through their app store, it automatically gets updated. Uh, and it doesn't let you shoot yourself in the foot. This security versus privacy thing, it really highlights the differences between a company like Apple and a company like Google. It's not black and white. Both these, you know, both of these guys are trying to do Google in its own weird way has been trying to get away from cookies and do less intrusive tracking. Uh, but they are an ad company. And then Apple has its ad business and it says that what happens on your iPhone stays in your iPhone. It doesn't always do that. I mean, so it's, it's not black and white, but uh, I think there still is enough uh, of a difference there. And, you know, that kind of calls out the difference between security and privacy. Well, there you go. And I think that's a good point that you mentioned about how Apple is less invested in ads than Google. So, you know, when you're paying, you know, 50% more for the logo on your laptop, <laughs> it's, it's not just that you're paying the Apple tax. It, you know, you're, you're paying, uh, so that your stuff is not necessarily ending up uh, being sold to ad companies. Um, I think you answered one of my early questions about why Macs might be more secure than than Windows machines. Um, and so I thought I'd just, a lot of these questions I have came from my reading of your new edition, the fifth edition of Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I just kind of teased out some questions that might be of interest to the audience. And uh, let's start with kind of the base layer stuff. You do a good job of explaining some of the key concepts in privacy software in the book. For example, uh, asymmetric encryption and hashing. And I thought we could lean in on your teaching ability here and have you explain for starters what asymmetric encryption is and why it is so important for digital privacy. Yeah, so for, you know, for the longest time, security and, and encryption was a symmetric thing, meaning there had to be, when you encrypt something, you have an algorithm, which is just a fancy name for a process, and you have something that you want to encrypt. You've got a plain text input. We call it the plain or clear text input uh, in, ter in crypt cryptography terms. Um, and so you want to put that, you want to take that through some algorithm such that when it comes out, nobody can read it except for the, your intended recipient. And so we have this process called encryption. And so there's the algorithm itself, which is well known and understood and vetted. It's open. It's not, it's not proprietary, ideally. And we have something as an input. And the other thing we have as an input is some sort of a key, something that's going to be used to encrypt that data. And with symmetric encryption, that key is the same. The key to encrypt the data is the same as the key to decrypt the data. And that's great, actually, for like data at rest, data like sitting on your hard drive. Like if you've got a journal that you want to protect with a password, that's fine because you're the person who's going to open and close that file and you know the password. So when you know you open the file and it's encrypted, you can enter the password, read the file, change the file, save the file and re-encrypt it. And, and that's fine. Where that becomes a problem and <laughs> is that if I need to share that with somebody else, particularly somebody that I can't meet, let's say, in person, uh, somebody over the internet uh, or somebody far away, then I have to not only get them the encrypted document, which is fine, which means that if it's encrypted, let you know, any courier along the way, if it's done properly, cannot read it. It's gobbledygook. It, it, it's encrypted. There's nothing they can do with it. They can't alter it. They can't, uh, they can't read it. Uh, but it also presupposes, you know, from a logistical standpoint, I have to somehow get the secret, the password, the, the key that's used to encrypt that data. I also have to get that to my recipient. And so if, if, if I have no way to do that securely, then I'm kind of back to square one. It's a catch 22 situation, um, or maybe a chicken and egg situation. So in the seventies, uh, some really smart people, um, came up with this idea of asymmetric encryption. And the beauty of this was you now have two keys and it's kind of like uh, a special lock in the book. I think I call it a super lock and the super lock has two keys, one to lock it and one to unlock it. And these keys are paired. They're, they're, they're created as a pair. Um, so asymmetric encryption works the same way. There's a public key and a private key and it's called public key encryption. And so the, the public key is well known. It's something you, it, that's why we call it public. It's something you tell everybody like, hey, if you want to send me an encrypted message, if you want to have private secure communication with me, here's my public key. Use this to encrypt your message to me. And so you make that available everywhere you can. On the internet, there are key servers that you can go to, for example, or if I've registered with a key server, anybody can go and find my public key and send me an encrypted message and lock it with the public key. And then, of course, when I get that message, I can now unlock it with the private key. And only I have the private key, which why we call it private. And I keep that very secure and safe on my devices. 
Uh, so such that somebody encrypts a message to me with the public key. And when I receive it, I can decrypt it with the private key that very, very neatly solves this problem of trying to pre-share and securely share a shared secret, a symmetric secret ahead of time. So that's, that's the basics of public key cryptography and, and the, and the pr problem that it solves, which is a, a big one. Um, this, and that's really how the internet works today. Almost everything you do today starts with an exchange and your computer does all this for you. You don't have to manage this yourself. Um, and it does it behind the scenes. And then it it's a, honestly, most kind it starts with a asymmetric setup and then it actually goes to symmetric. That's stuff you don't have to need to know. Um, but it, it, it really solves this problem neatly. And then hashing. Hashing is another cryptographic function. And it's what we call a trapdoor function or a one-way function. It's something that's very easy to go one way and very difficult to go the other way. And it's a it has a very interesting set of uses. Uh, but for one thing I could use it for is integrity. Like I can, with a hash function, you take some input, I don't care what it is. It could be clear text. It could be even encrypted if you wanted to. You have some blob of data that you put through this hashing function. No matter how big your blob of data is, what, what, what comes out the other side of a hashing function is a fixed length value. And it's a long, ugly looking value, but it's, 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 it's a fixed length, regardless of how big it is. In the book, I demonstrate this uh, with, I took the entire text of the book and put it through a hashing function and it got one value. And then I changed a single character out of the entire 600 pages of the book and hashed it again and got a completely different value. And so the way this works is it kind of takes a fingerprint uh, of that data. It means that if you put in the same data, you'll get the same output. And if you put in just something slightly different, you'll get a totally different output. And so you can use hashing functions in various ways. One of the ways we do that is kind of this fingerprinting function where I can say, okay, if I can hash this document, and get this value and someone else hashes the document I send them and get the same value, they must have been the same input. Nothing must have changed. So it could be used for integrity. It could be used for lots of other interesting purposes as well. But that's at a high level. That's <laughs> that's my explanation of, of asymmetric decryption and, and hashing. Well, and thank you for that. I don't think we can hear explanations of these things enough, especially since when we talk about digital privacy, that's essentially uh, what we're talking about, These these kinds of things. Somebody was just asking me this morning about whether they should be using an, an antivirus. And I typically deflect that. I say, look, uh, focus on your good online behavior. Be careful what you download. Be careful what you click on, all these sorts of things. Uh, an antivirus just by nature seems to be a somewhat of an in invasive program that one has on one's computer. Do you typically recommend any kind of anti-malware software? Yeah, that is a great question. And is it is a, an enduring question. Uh, in our space. And people ask me this, of course, all the time as well. And part of this is because, you know, the companies that make this software market this stuff like crazy, and they use a lot of FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, to try to get us to buy some of these products and, you know, make us believe that, you know, you're crazy if you don't run this program. And, and honestly, the, the answer, I think, has changed over the years. Back in the, back in the day, viruses uh, weren't quite as common. If you got them, they were probably on a floppy disk that you got from somebody else. And you're kind of, you know, uh, it's, there was a lower set of known malware. So a lot of these programs could actually just kind of fingerprint these things as we're talking, hashing might've been one of the things that could hash the program, uh, or look for other markers or indicators saying, Oh, I, I know what that is. That's malware. Let's not run that. Uh, but it, you know, now the, nowadays malware changes constantly. You can't, there's no way you could keep like a list of all the currently known malware and then block that. So you, ha you have to start doing more heuristic things. You have to start looking for behavior and maybe snippets of known code or, or things like that. And it's gotten much more fuzzy. Um, so just the nature uh, of malware and antivirus has, has changed over the years. But more than that, I think it's, I think it's really the marketing part that has changed or the, the economics part has changed because these companies want to make money uh, more ways. And there's, and some of the money that's been sitting on the table is for instance, your data, uh, and data mining has become such a big thing because especially in the U S we just have no regulations against it. And so I, the analogy I like to use for antivirus software is like hiring a bodyguard. And if you hire a bodyguard, this person is there to protect you. And you know, for your bodyguard to do their job, they need to have 100% full access to everything you're doing. They need to know who your drug dealer is. They need to be there when you're buying the drugs. They need to go to your mistress's house. They need you know, all your secrets, anything that you're doing that could be potentially risky, uh, they need to be involved in and they know everything. But with a human bodyguard, you could have them sign an NDA and sue them out of existence if they, if they breach it. Uh, with, with antivirus software, you're actually signing their terms of agreement and their their terms of service, which very much benefit them. And I'm sure if you dig through a lot of that, you'll find 
you know, that they are probably not only getting all up in your system and they have to have full, you know, access into everything on your system, all the files, but on all your online behavior, including in a lot of cases, breaking the encryption, the HTTPS encryption, so they can watch what you're downloading to make sure you're not downloading malware. Uh, and it, it's so invasive and it's so overzealous. And then on top of that, a lot of them have been shown to be mining your personal data. So it, the cure is almost worse than the disease. And so I, I happen to agree with you. I, what I tell most people is uh, not to use it. Firstly, on a Mac, I, and most of my computers are Macs. I've got a lot of them, um, but most of my computers are Macs. My main computers are Macs, and I don't use antivirus software. My mom has a Mac. I don't tell her to use antivirus software either, and I just try to teach her about good on online hygiene. You don't want to click links that you weren't expecting, open documents where you weren't expecting uh, from untrusted sources, you know, these kind of things that we'll probably cover some of these today. Uh, you know, that really goes a long way to protecting yourself. Now, on Windows, there, there's a, a slight exception on Windows because Microsoft does make their own antivirus software called Defender, and it comes for free with Windows. And that, so if you're, you happen to be on Windows, Windows, I do tell people, go ahead and use that. That's fine. Uh, it's actually pretty good, actually. It's come a long way. Windows Defender does a pretty good job. It's free. It, it, it's all, <laughs> it's from the same company that owns your operating system. So they're already all up in your business anyway. It may still be mining your data, but Microsoft, oh, is, Windows is probably mining your data too. So, you know, in that sense, it's no worse. So that, that the long answer is, I agree with you. I generally tell people, the cure is usually worse than the disease. It's probably not worth your effort, certainly to get a four pay antivirus on Mac. You know, if you if you want a one time, like if you want a second opinion, if you want to say, well, is my computer's acting funny at that point, I would say, OK, fine, you know, download malware bytes and you can do a free run, uh, with, you know, free trial with malware bytes and scan your computer as an on demand kind of a thing. But I generally don't tell people to install antivirus software. What I do for anybody who's interested is, first of all, get away from Windows, uh, save that for gaming if you must, but only for that, get onto a Mac, or if you're a little bit more advanced, move over to uh, Linux, and obviously train yourself to be very uh, careful what you're doing on your computer. If you have some kind of shady thing that you're doing, reserve that for virtual box or some kind of virtual machine, which you can just wipe. And I also just reset my device uh, entirely, re reinstall the operating system every six months. So that's kind of how how I go about um, these sorts of things. Also, it's also one of my minimalist practices so that I, I never rely on all the extra settings and I try to keep it as vanilla as possible. On the, on the topic of digital hygiene, a lot of nasty stuff these days can come from emails. And I wondered what is your general advice for how we should handle emails to ensure maximum cybersecurity. So we're talking, um, how should we treat attachments? How skeptical should we be of links? Um, what is your approach when you check in your email, check your email for the day? What do you do to make sure that you're as secure as you can be? Yeah, and obviously, you know, we've been using email for a long time. And when email was created, it really didn't have you know, security and privacy in mind, which which means that in a lot of cases, you really can't trust the sender. It can, it can be very easily spoofed. So, you know, beware that and that I'm sure most of us with all the spam and, and things we've gotten today have gotten used to this now, but just because it says it's from Apple or from Amazon or your bank doesn't mean it is. Um, so, you know, be careful of that. Um, look for, you know, a lot of the emails that are going to contain shady stuff uh, will have uh, some sort of urgent request, some sort of usually fear-based thing, but sometimes it's a positive thing. So if, it, you know, if, you know, like anything in life, if it's too good to be true or too bad to be true, question it. And so, you know, a lot of these attempts will say, you know, we've locked your account, uh, you, you know, you need to do something about that. Click here to fix it. Don't do that. <laughs> Sometimes, hey, you won something, click here to claim it. Uh, I've seen a lot of them along the lines of, you know, hey, here's that $5,000 thing you ordered. Everything's going great. We'll ship it to you soon. If you have any trouble with that, click the invoice, you know, because you didn't order anything for $5,000. Right. Or, or some... Yeah, and some of them will also appeal to your 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 cybersecurity instincts. So it'll say, "Look, your account's compromised. You need to act now." And because you're you've listened to the show and you're worried about your cybersecurity, you're like, "Oh shoot, I better do something." Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So the spammers have gotten really good, and actually, uh, the, with the new, you know, a lot of them are, are non English speaking. Uh, attackers so that you know there will be english mistakes and you'll see punctuation grammar errors and things like that that can tip you off uh but with you know chat gpt <laughs> and some of these new ai tools they're going to get a lot better and a lot and they're going to get a lot more targeted even for general populace so it's going to get worse uh but yeah so generally speaking just 
you know, be careful if you didn't request it, if you didn't specifically ask for something and you get something with a link or a button or an attachment, question it. Um, if you really feel like you need to open some attachment, you can try to carefully download it and then maybe upload it to virus total to see if virus total thinks it's got a problem. You know, if you are not familiar with that, it's basically an online antivirus checker that runs it through like 60 different online or 60 different programs. So it'll, it'll give a broad spectrum check against, uh, you know, known viruses. This is not perfect, but I mean, you know, it's pretty good. Um, and otherwise, you know, if you if you're worried about it, if it, if it seems convincing and you're worried that it may be correct, uh, go to the site manually. So if it's your bank, if it's Amazon, if it's eBay, you know, log into your account directly without using any of the links provided, and and, and go to the account. And if there's something wrong, there will there will be some sort of an obvious notification there waiting for you there, and you can deal with it then. Uh, but you know, a lot of times they're they're they're, they're fake. However, so you just that's that's really today i think that's just the worst thing you got to be looking for phishing attempts you got to be looking for malware infection attempts and they're always from these crappy spammy emails uh and they're trying to get you to urgently do something without thinking and just be careful and it, and also one more thing i will say is it, just because you got it from somebody you know uh including a company either a company you work with or somebody you know including and in, it could even be a response to an email chain that you've already got going you know it could mean that that a your other friend's account has been compromised, uh, or it could just be spoofed. Um, so that happens as well. So just, you know, don't just because it's from somebody you think, you know, and trust be extra careful if it seems fishy pun intended, you know, your, your friend could be passing on a file that they don't even know has malware on it as well. That's the nature of a virus. What about, uh, we get a, we get an email. We know we do not want to be on this mailing list, or we do not want to be part of this, uh, newsletter or what have you. Should we be clicking unsubscribe at the bottom of that newsletter or should we treat it in a different way? That's a great question. It's a really tough question. It really kind of depends on who's sending it. Um, if it's a reputable company, somebody you know and, and you remember signing up for something, uh, then yeah, I, you know, you can trust the unsubscribe. If it's out of nowhere, like someone sold out your email address to someone else and put you on a list or maybe something you signed up for, you didn't notice there was a checkbox at the bottom that said, oh, and please send me a weekly newsletter crap. Uh, you know, you accidentally did that. Some of those are not, <laughs> they're not as, they're not as easy to trust. So it's really a gray area. It really depends on how much you think you can trust them. If they've already got your email address in some sense, it's not much different to go ahead and click on subscribe and confirm that they've got your email address. But some of these things are literally shotgun. Like they've made up email addresses or maybe they got them from uh, the dark web. Some, you know, they, there was some breach with a whole bunch of email addresses in it and they got a list and they don't know if it's still a good address anymore. They're just trying it. And sometimes by saying unsubscribe, you've now confirmed that it's a valid email address and then you're just going to invite more of that crap. So it's really it's, it's a tough call. And so if it's something, if it falls into a gray area, what I usually do is I will just mark it as spam. Um, and there's a, that depending on how you mark it as spam, you're either telling your, your local client, uh, in some cases, like on the Apple mail client or things like that, you're telling Apple that it's spam. And so that client may then try to recognize those in the future for you. Um, or if it's through like a web portal where you're using web mail, uh, you're, you're telling your service provider, your email service provider, uh, Outlook, uh, whoever, uh, that this is spam. That also helps them to fight spam. So uh, it's not just for you, but it also helps them to to find these letters and maybe prevent them from going to other people. So you know, if, it's, if you if you know you signed up for it and you trust the company, I would say unsubscribe is fine. If you if you're at all unsure about the, uh, the propriety of the, <laughs> of the of the company sending it, uh, then I would just mark it as spam and delete it. How about this scenario, Kerry? Let's say that I have copied in my clipboard. I have a long random password for one of my accounts and I am going about my day and suddenly I press paste and I've forgotten that that is uh, in the clipboard. I thought something else was in the clipboard. And so I'm filling out some kind of form or I'm logging in somewhere else and I put a password for a different, for a different service into that text box. And then I say, oops, and I delete it right away. Uh, I'm good, right? That's That hasn't been recorded by that particular text box. Is that right? Your, your question is obviously leading me to say, no, you're not good because you know, you know that you're not good, but your audience may not. So this is especially with the advent of almost all web pages that are active web pages. There used to be the, a great little plugin called NoScript that would block JavaScript because back in the day, JavaScript was kind of a icing on the cake. It was some sites had it, some sites didn't. And a lot of times it was stuff you didn't want anyway. Today, all sites are active sites and they're all full of JavaScript. They're all running code. You know, it's not, these are not static web pages anymore. So it turns out that 
no, you're not safe. Anything you enter today into a form can be saved by the site you're on, or perhaps sometimes even by plugins or uh, other JavaScript from third parties that are running in that web page, like, you know, Facebook uh, like buttons and uh, pixels and, and things like that. Sometimes they can get access to the form data as well. And a lot of times that data is saved off whether you click submit or not. Um, so, so they act a lot of times, honestly, they act like key loggers, like everything you enter can be saved. And you may not know this as well, uh, but a lot of these sites will actually they, they pay attention to how you go through the form. They know where your mouse is moving. They know when you're tabbing. They know when you're typing. And a lot of times this is for analytics. Like they want to see how do people interact with their page and can we improve that? Okay, I get that. But along the way, they're also recording everything, everything you do to the point where sometimes those companies can go back and say, okay, let's see how Carrie interacted with this form. And they can actually replay everything that you did while you were on that page. So no, you are <laughs> the, the shorter answer is no, you are not okay. If it's, it, it is possible, let's just put it this way. It's possible that something you entered into a form without hitting, hitting submit was still captured by the site or by a plugin that you're using or by some other third party JavaScript running on that page. Yeah, that's good. That's going to be sobering to a lot of people. But as you were talking, I just went into my, my key pass, I see password manager. And previously I had uh, removed the, uh, so by, by default, it's, it's, removes, it clears your clipboard after 10 seconds. And I had removed that out of convenience. I've, I've just uh, reinitiated it though. So it will clear my clipboard after um, uh, a certain amount of seconds here. So uh, it, it, it can be costly to, to make mistakes, unfortunately. It's a slight tangent here. And the reason I wanna ask this is because not a lot of people talk about it and I think uh, have thought about it, much less given advice. So you have spoken on your show about the kinds of things that can happen when you're personal information is given to a doctor's office and then it uh, becomes exposed through the the myriad ways that uh, my audience knows that you put things in databases, et cetera. It's, it's just asking for them to get leaked or breached. So obviously one puts one's health first anytime, et cetera, et cetera. But what is your just kind of general advice for we're getting medical care somewhere and they're asking for all this information, et cetera, et cetera. We're having to give some of it. What's the best thing we can do to ensure the least amount of our personal data is vulnerable while still getting certain medical care? Yeah, that is, that is a tough one. And you're probably not going to like the, my first answer is vote <laughs> because what we really need is regulations around this stuff. Uh, there's been a lot of really nasty cases in the news lately. One was good RX. Uh, and others, but there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of online brokers and portals uh, and healthcare services out there today that are not really protecting your data the way they should and not legally bound to protect your data like a lot of people assume they must be. You know, in the United States, we have this law called HIPAA and everyone seems to think, oh, it's healthcare data. It must be, it must be secret. It must be kept safe. It must not be shared. That is definitely not true. Um, so, uh, short of having better regulations and putting representatives in office that will make that happen, uh, you need to limit what you share uh, to as little as possible. For example, uh, some of my doctors have these portals where it's all through a third party. They've contracted this out to someone else. They've got some service that they run for check-in. You know, I've got some upcoming appointment and some third party says, hey, you know, let's save your doctor some time. Let me ask you all your health questions now before you go to the doctor. Uh, and, and I don't do that. I, I just skip it. And because I know that I, when I get there, I can just tell the nurse and she can put that in my record if, if they need it. Um, and we could have some give and take on whether or not they need that information as opposed to this portal that will complain if I don't answer every single question. Um, you know, and they'll, the, these portals, these, these will ask you, you know, all the drugs you're on right now, you know, all the, they'll ask you, are you depressed? And they'll ask you all the you know, kind of the common, you know, doctor visit questions that they, that the nurse will run through before the doctor comes in. Uh, but it's going to some third party and I don't trust that. So I know that sounds tinfoil hatty. I know it sounds black helicopter ish, you know, but not on this show, <laughs> uh, so, but don't, so don't overshare, uh, you know, keep stuff to yourself until unless it's absolutely necessary. So I, I try to avoid those portals. And then honestly, I'll even go so far as when I'm in my doctor's office, uh, you know, if, if I want to ask a question about something that I'm thinking about or some weird symptoms I'm having, sometimes I'll even say, look, this is hypothetical. I, let's, I don't want this on my record because I'm not sure what this is. You know, if this, 
but you know, so I want to ask you some, some questions that I would just rather you not type down and I'll actually see them like set aside their laptop, you know, as we ask these questions. Right. And, and they, and I have to take their word for it. They won't do it later, but there are some things I just don't even want to have in my record. So yeah, no, that's, that's some just good basic techniques. And obviously if, if you're watching, please, uh, participate in just being, uh, being minimalist about, uh, what you give, don't just always comply. Don't just always fill out anything that's just put in front of you that just encourages people to to keep asking more and more in, invasive questions that might not even be necessary. Carrie, how about a uh, how about a, a quick rapid fire uh, segment where I just ask you some some of the privacy tools that you use? I like to do this for various guests. I think I know the answer to this. What operating system do you use? Let's say besides besides Mac, what is the second most common operating system you use on your computer? Probably Linux. Um, I've got some various places where I use Linux, but I've, I've got Linux and Windows and Mac all over the house. But my primary, as you know, is Mac. What about your uh, phone and phone operating system? iPhone and iOS. All right. A VPN. And do you use one at the router level? Uh, that could be a really long answered question, but the quick answer is uh, I use Proton VPN when I, when I use a VPN. Uh, it would be nice to have one at the router level, but VPNs are just they're not really built for what we want them to do. And they cause a lot of grief um, because a lot of places try to figure out where you are and they get confused when you come from different places. VPNs can cause a lot of heartache. So I, I tend to use them more on demand. If I had less trouble with, with VPNs as far as the impacts of what they do, I would do it at the router level all the time. Uh, but in practice, me personally, uh, I just use it on demand. Yeah, I've been using router level VPN for a couple of years here and there are problems Nothing, nothing existential. I keep an extra uh, software VPN that I can just put on top of it, and that will oftentimes get me around whatever hurdles uh, I encounter. What about what is your preferred password manager? Uh, for many, many, many years, uh, based on and we've we've got these hierarchies, right? Like we have people that we go to that we respect you know, for recommendations, right? And for many years, uh, I use LastPass because it was recommended by people I trusted. Uh, and of course, with the recent breach, um, I've. Certainly, I've told people if you're going to start fresh and use a, a start start with if you've never used a password manager before, I recommend Bitwarden now. What percentage of your traffic is on the Tor browser? Almost none. Tor is really really slow. You know, for me, a VPN is is will cover most of what I want to do. Honestly, Tor is not a silver bullet either. There, Tor actually is not the be all end all. It, it's got some problems, especially if you're worried about like nation state actors. Uh, name a privacy security software or two that we haven't named so far that you like. Okay. Um, I really like Cryptomator. Uh, it's a great little tool for creating uh, secure folders. Uh, it's free and open source. Uh, it, I, I like, it's a great solution if you want to keep using something like Google Drive or Dropbox or one of these, you know, more popular cloud storage services where you don't control the encryption keys. This at least gives, at least gives you a space within there where you do control that. So I like Cryptomator. Uh, I also use uh, Lulu, which is a Mac version of Portmaster. <laughs> Basically, it's a uh, it's something that lets you control outbound traffic on your computer. So we haven't really talked about that, but that's something I I know and unlike. Um, Portmaster is great, by the way. I, I, I would wish they had a Mac version someday. They will, but until then, I use Lulu. And then uh, they've also got a product called SPN, which is great, but it's also currently Windows uh, Windows and Linux only. Okay. And real last one, realistically, honestly, what percentage of the time do you verify the software that you're downloading? If I were doing a lot of stuff outside the app stores, I would do it more often. But honestly, most of what I do, I, I try to do through the approved app stores, which is which takes care of most of that for you, which is one of the reasons I like doing it. And the other thing is it's kind of hard, it's still hard to do because if you're downloading from a website and on that website it shows you the you know, the fingerprint or the hash or whatever for the device, well, they could, you know, the bad guys, if they're if they've hijacked the site, they could change that too. So it's even that's not perfect, but yes, it practically speaking though, the way I, the way I do software and I, if I was on Linux, it might be a little different, but it, you know, on a Mac, I generally don't put myself in a situation where I often have to do that. So not often. Let's say that, um, somebody is ready to sell or recycle or donate one of their devices. Uh, I tell people to just not just take out your hard drive, your solid state drive, whenever you can, and just reuse that. Don't, don't give that away in general, but in general, how should people prepare a device that they are ready to let go? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that I don't think a lot of people think about, and they definitely should be, especially today, because so many devices now, uh, for instance, if you buy like a corporate level uh, printer, a lot of corporate printers have hard drives on them. So everything you've ever printed, or at least to, to some amount of history, is often on on those hard drives. Um, that, I don't know how common that is with, with home printers. Um, probably not that common. But 
so many devices now do have memory. And so you have to be careful with that. What I honestly, for the most part, tell people is in terms of worrying about data that might be left over on your devices, if you have set up full disk encryption, uh, that's really your best bet because that way everything is scrambled. Uh, and then as long as you remove the accounts associated with uh, the, the, uh, that computer before you sell it, any data that that is still on there in some way, shape or form should be completely unintelligible. So um, that I, I tell people to make sure that they have uh, full disk encryption turned on from day one. You can turn it on after the fact, um, but it's better to do it from the beginning. And that way, when before you sell it, uh, you need to remove any accounts that you have. What I'll often do is create a new administrator account. Uh, and then from that new administrator account, I'll delete all my other accounts and then I'll uh, wipe and reinstall the operating system just for good measure. Um, you can, I, I, if you can, if you have the wherewithal to open that puppy up and actually remove the hard drive, great, more power to you. Um, but uh, I think in most cases that if you've, if you've done full disk, disk encryption and you make sure that the, any accounts associated with those uh, any data on that drive has been removed. I think it should be in pretty good shape. It's, but the, another thing you need to do, and this is something that's a part of modern life, is almost all our devices now are associated with some cloud account, whether that be from Apple or Microsoft or Google. Um, so now you also need these extra steps of making sure that you log out of any of those accounts and deregister those devices and disassociate those devices from your iCloud or OneDrive or Google Play or some of the, all these other accounts. Uh, so there's some extra steps there too. If you just Google, uh, I hate to use that as a verb because I don't like using Google, but if you do a web search on, you know, how to prepare my device for sale or donation, and you put in your operating system, whether it be Android or iOS or Mac OS or Windows, you can find some good online guides, usually from, you know, Apple, Microsoft or Google, that'll help you walk through uh, these sorts of checklists uh, before you get rid of the device. You talk in Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons, 5th edition that you regularly restart your devices, including your your network router. What is the advantage of doing that from a cybersecurity perspective and how often realistically should we be resetting things? Yeah, so it turns out uh, that a lot of malware, particularly malware that runs on like IoT type devices or appliance uh, level type devices like your home router would be, um, exist only in, in, in RAM in, in, in memory and not on the drive, uh, such that if you reboot it, it's cleaned. Uh, so a lot of people don't realize that. And so because your router is the gateway to your home, uh, and it is a common target for, uh, attackers because it is so important because of its privileged access and location in kind of your network setup. Um, it's an important one to kind of periodically, reboot just to, just in case the other thing the other reason you might do this even if you if you're not worried about getting malware on there is it can honestly just improve performance over time some you know some of these things have memory leaks and they'll get a lot of cruft basically a you know, software engineering cruft someone someone didn't free up some memory somewhere and so handles to bits of memory or pipes or things like that are, are left around they get cluttered up in the memory so it's still it's also just good maintenance uh, to to reboot your devices every once in a while so it as far as how often depends on what you're willing to do. If you're, if you really want to be hyper vigilant about it, maybe once a week, I would probably just, I think once a month is fine in most cases. And while you're doing that, make sure there hasn't been any updates, you know, look for router updates. So somebody is, as we just mentioned, they're, they're fiddle, fiddling around with their router. They're, they're trying to improve their network security. There's all kinds of things we could discuss. Let's just focus on one though. They come across this kind of eye rolling term, <laughs> IPv6. What is that uh, and what should we do about it? Okay, so IP is, stands for Internet Protocol and version six is the V6 part. And I, Internet Protocol has been around since, you know, well before most of us are, were thinking about the internet. It's been around decades. And IP version four has been the one that we've mostly been using for many, many years. And, and the main limitation to IPv4 it, and these are the IP addresses that you may, if you've seen these, it's, you know, 10.0.0.1, it's 192.168.0.5, you know, it's these kind of addresses that we've seen. If you've ever seen an IP address, you'd recognize it. It's four decimals se separated by periods. And these IP addresses top out at four, about 4 billion. So if you, if you look at the maximum number of addresses, unique addresses you can create with that structure, it's about 4 billion. And you might think, well, that's, that's a lot. But uh, with the Internet of Things, uh, it turns out that we we passed 
4 billion devices on the internet a long time ago. Um, so now you're thinking, well, how does that work? Well, that's because your home router actually does this thing called network address translation, where you've actually got a list of private IP addresses in your home. All the devices in your home are given a private address, and those addresses are reused in other people's homes. So, you know, your your smart TV at your house might have an address of 10.0.0.5, and then someone else's webcam might have that address and in their home house, in, in their home network. Um, because they're reused, they're not, those aren't exposed to the public internet. And your router does the job of converting from your one single like street address, your one public IP address that was given to you by an internet service provider and maps it to all the private internal reusable addresses that are in your home. Uh, so that's how we got around this limitation. Um, but IPv6, on the other hand, uh, we, you know, they decided, okay, we, we run out of numbers. Let's, so let's, let's create this thing called IPv6 that among other things has a much, much bigger address space. Someone once told me that if you, if you took every grain of sand on the surface of the earth, you could give it its own unique IPv6 address, and then you'd still have an, enough left for a hundred more earths. Uh, it's, it's just crazy how many different addresses there are. So that's, IPv6 does a lot of other things. Some people, you know, I've heard people say that it's got all these security features. I honestly, I haven't looked into it enough to know that there's really a lot of security benefit to IPv6. The, the, the real big one has been having this increased address space. But so here, here's the thing that I worry about with IPv6. Because you now have the capability to give every device on the planet connected to the internet a unique address, you technically no longer need this network address translation feature. And it's actually, a, it's a great security by obscurity feature because with, you know, with, with the current IPv4 system and NAT, all the devices in your house are, have unaddress, are unaddressable outside your house. Um, with IPv6, theoretically, you could bypass that. You could actually have every device in your house have a unique publicly addressable IPv6 address which to me would be a bad thing. Like that would basically mean that all these devices are now viewable outside your house, which is not a good thing. So I personally, I mean, IPv6 has its place. I think, you know, in, in enterprise and, and backbone and all those kind of places they can use IPv6, that's fine. But inside my house, I don't use it. You don't, you don't need it. So uh, on my router, I tend to disable it. Let's say that we are just going around the internet and we find ourselves wanting to visit a website, which we're not exactly sure if it's a good website to be visiting. Um, maybe we're trying to buy, uh, example I give, we're trying to to find the best place to buy baseball cards or something, and there's a there are a variety of websites uh, that are dedicated to this topic. Do you have any general advice for how we can assess, gauge a website's reputation and security risk? Yeah, and it, I mean, but it's a valid question because you know, there's a lot of great sites out there and some of which we are not familiar with. and. On, on, unfortunately, the answer really is it's almost impossible to tell if it's a if it's a really big name brand with a reputation to protect and some history behind that reputation. Uh, you know, you can you could glean something from that. That's honestly there's that's there's not much else you can do because there's really no way to know. And of course, we know that even some of these bigger companies with reputations to protect still make mistakes. A lot of them do. And so, it, of course, it depends on what you mean by bad. Are they going to leak your data? Are they going to share your data? Are they going to get hacked? Um, nothing is 100% secure. And we've seen a lot of big name sites get hacked. Um, I mean, LastPass was hacked. Very targeted attack. Uh, but nevertheless, they were hacked. So, and they're a security company. Uh, the NSA, you know, was was defeated by one guy. Yeah. You know, so nothing is 100% secure. And nothing, you know, so... Instead, I would basically assume that in most cases, you just need to be careful. So don't overshare. Don't don't give them any more information than necessary. In particular, if you're worried about like shopping online, use virtual credit card numbers. A lot of credit card companies now have this feature where you can log into your account online and get a one time use credit card number that will map internally to your regular one. But you're not giving out your credit, your real credit card number, and it will only use They'll only be used on that side or maybe only be used one time. You can often configure them different ways. You can set spending limits on these sometimes. Privacy.com is, is, is a whole service built around that concept. So, and, and you could use email aliases, for example. We haven't talked about aliasing that much, but there's a lot of free and easy ways today to get, you know, basically throw away email addresses that will route to your inbox, but then you can turn off at any point and you will no longer receive emails on those addresses anymore. There are ways that you can basically minimize the information you're giving away, especially to sites that you might only visit once or twice uh, or that you, for some reason, don't trust. 
Uh, another thing you can do, by the way, when you're using a password manager is a lot of sites like Amazon will offer to save your credit card information for future use. And you might think, oh, okay, great. Now I don't have to enter that stuff anymore. Well, actually, if you're using if you're using Bitwarden or uh, one of these password managers, their plugin also has a facility for saving credit card information. So you could just click a button and fill it in that way too and not save it on the website. So I, I wouldn't, honestly, in most cases, I would say I wouldn't trust most sites and I would just plan to not give them any, any more information than absolutely necessary because it's really, it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard to tell just by looking at a website how, how good they are. I'll add to that just if it's if it doesn't have the little lock up at the top left, it's not HTTPS, that uh, might not be something you want to be spending a ton of time on, certainly giving your uh, payment information. Uh, there, there's some websites like uh, Web of Trust. Uh, you don't even have to download the extension. You can just kind of go to the website, type it in, see the comments that people are leaving, whether or not uh, some of them are jaded, but sometimes you can get some insight uh, regarding that. And if, you're, if you are going to these kind of websites, I just advocate for people to uh, get that extra device going and have a separate device for that part of your life or a virtual machine of some kind that you can reset regularly. You had a recent episode on your podcast, Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons, about planting flags. So a lot of people don't realize that just because, uh, let's say that they, they have some kind of service. They went to a hospital um, where they they have an account that they're not aware of, or they have a social security. Obviously, if you're an American, you have a social security account. Uh, and you may not have ever actually gone to a website to to view that, or maybe you you use your utilities, you pay that in cash or something. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that there is the ability for you to have an account online. And just because you have your whatever investing account and you always go talk to the to the person in person, uh, it doesn't it you have the ability to have an online account for that thing. And if you don't get that first, it is possible for somebody else to take that account and obviously they could do some nefarious things. I wonder if you could expand upon that, the importance of planting flags and maybe a few examples of the kind of flags people should be planting. Yeah, actually, and, and you've and you've covered quite a bit of it there. The, the, the idea with planting your flag is like you said, there are many accounts that we have, whether we want them or not. And for there's certainly a lot of governmental accounts, and this would include, you know, in here in the United States, for example, the IRS uh, for tax purposes, Social Security Administration for retirement. Medicare, um, even the U.S. Postal Service uh, has a, a, a rather interesting online account for everybody uh, with a mailing address called Informed Delivery. And you can, when you sign up for this account, get a, an image sent to you every day of all the mail you should get in your mailbox today, which, by the way, means that they're doing this regardless. <laughs> they're, they're scanning and maintaining images of every piece of mail that you receive. Uh, but it's, you know, you can sign up for this account and see it yourself. But if you don't, for example, someone else could, if they if they can convince the U.S. Postal Service that they are you, and they're probably, honestly, with, I, as I recall, signing up for this myself, there wasn't a whole lot of information they needed to sign up for this account. They could stop and start your mail, uh, have it held for you, and then try to pretend to be you to pick it up. They can sign up for this informed delivery and actually see what you're getting in your mail. And let's say maybe you're getting a credit card offer, and it's, and it's obvious from the envelope that that's what this is. Maybe they try to intercept that before you come home and get your mail, and then apply for the credit card in your name. Uh, so these are examples of ways that if people can sign up for these accounts, uh, they can do things in your name for their benefit and leave you holding the bag. For IRS, for example, they could they if they can sign up for the IRS account in your name and and steal that account from you before you've claimed it for yourself, because it's it, anybody can register for, for this account if you haven't already done so. It's waiting there for somebody to register for, and so that's why you want to plant your flag. You want to claim it for yourself before someone else does. Uh, they could, for example, for the IRS, they could file a fake tax return and have the money sent to someone else claiming you have a big refund. Uh, I've actually heard of people stealing you know, uh, health benefits if signing up for either your Social Security or Medicare uh, or uh, your doctor's portal or something and you'll go in for your annual physical and, and they'll say, well, you've already had one this year because someone did it for you and took and took that benefit from you. Other ones you've you also kind of alluded to that are, that are your local utilities. A lot of people, maybe if you've lived in this house for a long time, you know, you signed up for some auto draft to pay your to pay your bill, uh, but you can also sign up for an online account and it's sitting there waiting for you to do so. And if someone else does it in your stead, uh, they can potentially use that against you. Sometimes you can use utility bills to get access to other accounts as a proof of ownership or proof of, uh, you know, I am who I say I am because look, this utility bill I can print, it's got my name on it. You know, medical portals, there's there's so many. I've actually just recently wrote an article about this on my blog 
uh, that I'm sure you can go find if you look for plant your flag on firewallstonesubdragon.com where the, with links to a lot of these, uh, a lot of these different accounts, but medical, you know, loans, mortgages, uh, retirement accounts, a lot of these ones, even if you don't, if you didn't necessarily set up it yourself, they do have an account waiting for you. And if you don't claim it, someone else might, and then get up to some mischief. So I'm looking, I'm just looking at Slack here, Kerry. And as I try to sign in, it has an option to sign in with a Google account, sign in with an Apple account. There are some other websites that let you sign in with a Facebook account. Well, I have some of those logins. Uh, why not just use those to sign in? Is that a is that a wise cybersecurity move? It's bad for security and bad for privacy, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the funny thing is, is, under the covers, it's using uh, something called OAuth. It's kind of a single sign-on thing. The, the the OAuth spec is 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 good actually from a security standpoint. I mean, from the mechanics of doing the authentication. It's, it's plenty secure, um, but there's there's two main problems with this. First of all, let's talk about privacy. So when you're signing in with Facebook or signing in with Google, uh, you are, at a bare minimum, what you're doing now is every time you use this other service, uh, Google and Facebook are going to know about it. So they're already, they're, they're, you're setting up a data sharing relationship there. Uh, and because of just, just because of the mechanics of the login process, they will always know when you're going to these sites and logging in. So you're giving them some information. Uh, more than that, there's probably also uh, an implicit data sharing agreement with some of these companies as well. And so what, all you're doing is you're avoiding creating a new account, which a lot of people don't want to do because, oh, that's one more. I need you know give them my email address and now I got to come up with another password to remember. But if you're using a password manager, that doesn't matter because your your password manager is going to generate that password for you and save it and fill it in for you. There's there's really no con inconvenience there. So I would, if you're presented with that option, I would definitely just create your own personal account. But for, also from a security standpoint, and this I've actually seen articles about this recently. Um, you are also having a single sign-on situation where if somebody were now to compromise your Facebook account. Let's say they were somehow able to guess your password for Facebook or guess your password for Google. Now, every place where you have signed in with Facebook or signed in with Google, they can also sign in as well. Uh, and so now it's not just access to your Facebook and Google account they've got. They've also now got access to any other place where you use them as your authenticator, basically. So that's a, that's a security problem as well. Um, the one interesting counterpoint to all of that is the sign in with Apple. Apple made a big point of of saying, certainly on every iOS app, if you're going to offer a button on your app that says sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google, you must also now offer sign in with Apple. It's gotta be the same size font. It's gotta be basically on equal footing as these other ones as a valid option. And Apple actually made a point of making that a private thing. They actually try to hide some information from uh, the person you're signing up with. You could even give them a dummy email address or an email alias that you can create on the fly. Um, so they actually added some interesting privacy features. So if you must do it, then I would, you know, and you have the option to sign in with Apple, I, you know, okay. But I honestly, most people, I just say, you know, just, just skip that, create an account with your email and a password and have a dedicated account for each one. It keeps them all segregated. It, it doesn't have the single sign on security problem. Uh, and it doesn't have the, the privacy issues. Excellent. That's a great explanation for something that, uh, this audience hopefully has been doing, which is just have your password manager, have a unique login for every website. Don't be relying on these logins from big tech companies for obvious reasons. In addition to, um, the ones that you mentioned. So Kerry, how about people who are, who have a family and who are also interested in privacy and security? Obviously there are uh, difficulties in, in getting your family on board, getting your kids on board. You might be, you might be all on board for this yourself, but you have to, uh, you know, drag the family along with you. Any kind of pointers to get people started, maybe some tips and tricks, et cetera. And I've, I've struggled with this with my own family and it, my family's not that, not that big, but trying to get everybody kind of on the same page with these things is, can be difficult. I do, you know, for example, for cloud storage, I use sync.com, which allows me to control the encryption keys. I've gotten every, all of us away from Dropbox. We used to use Dropbox back in the day. Uh, now we use sync.com. Uh, I've gotten all my family onto LastPass, which is actually now an impediment to moving from LastPass to Bitwarden because now I need to move them with me. Uh, but it can be done. And a lot of these products have, in particular, these password manager accounts have family accounts, uh, which mostly it's a billing thing. It, it gives you a discount on having more people under one roof, but it also opens you up to some other really great features uh, for sharing passwords among people in your family. Uh, if you've got shared accounts uh, that you want to have, it also has a really interesting emergency backup feature. Uh, so that if you become incapacitated or God, God forbid you die, uh, you can pre-set up 
a situation where someone in your family can then take over your account uh, by requesting it. And it's usually kind of a dead man switch situation where they request it and you have a certain amount of time to say, no, I'm still alive. I'm not dead yet. Uh, and you can, and you can de- deny it. And, but eventually, you know, if something were to happen to you, they can use this to, cause they're going to need access after you pass or, or, or if you become incapacitated, someone's going to need to take care of your accounts. And so it, it's good for someone to have access to your password manager. There are other, other products, um, that are starting to offer family accounts. It can be really good just to have people on the same account. For example, uh, Proton Mail. If if you and your recipient are sending emails that are both uh, under Proton, then it's automatically fully encrypted end to end, which is not the case. If you're on Proton, you can have a Proton account, but if somebody in my family has got a Gmail account, uh, I have to jump through a lot of hoops and they do too, if I want to have an encrypted communication with them. So it, it, there are a lot of benefits to getting everybody on the same page. And so it can be tricky, um, but it's really good to kind of have the unified thing. And so, you know, maybe set up a, a kind of an appointment where you guys in, are working together on these things, make a checklist, uh, ha- have a group Zoom session or something where you're kind of helping them work through this. And maybe you do a screen share where you can take over and help them walk through some of these things. A lot of times it's probably going to be, you know, shoulder as much of that as you can and help them through it as best you can. Uh, but it, it, there are benefits to trying to get your, your family all kind of unified on, on some of these privacy and security measures. And it, but it's, it is tricky and it's going to take some effort. This has been very informative, uh, very good look behind the scenes from somebody who can explain a lot of this stuff that is talked about in, in privacy and security, but it's not always, we don't always get to the root of it because people don't always have the, um, the ability to understand the code and some of the processes behind this. This has been very informative. His uh, podcast is Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. That's the name of his book. The fifth edition just came out. It's a long book, lots of Lots of photos in there. It documents your uh, your journey towards um, you know locking down your life and and having better cybersecurity. Uh, any final thoughts, Gary? Obviously, we'll have links to all your stuff in the in the video and podcast. Any final thoughts? Well, well, first of all, you know, Gabriel, thanks for having me on the show. It's been a lot of fun. I'm glad to have people like you out there doing this too. The more of the merrier. We really need to get people, uh, you know, protecting their privacy and security. The more of us do this, the the better it is for all of us. And so it's you know share this with your with other people help other people like you know if, if you're listening to the show you're probably already doing some of these things uh, so the next level for me is is now take that somewhere and help other people to do the same thing uh, that a lot of people don't have your skill set a lot of people don't have your drive uh, so helping other people do this uh, will make us all more secure because your security and your privacy overlaps my security and my privacy you know some of your data gets loose it affects me as well you know when you take pictures there's generally more people in those pictures than just yourself. Uh, your contact list has a lot of other people in it. Your privacy and your security overlap mine. So it's a we thing. It's not just a me thing. So I guess what I would implore people to do is once you've done these things for yourselves, help other people to do them as well. 